Hey folks, and welcome to another edition of Zog Science. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our evolution unit by getting into some population dynamics. So uh, a little bit of context. Uh, last time we talked about behaviors of organisms. Uh, well, organisms, when you put them all together, uh, we get a population. Um, they, they do have to be made up of the same species uh, living in the same area, and populations are going to be changing over time. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Um, so just kind of the basic uh, theories uh, that go into this. Uh, organisms enter a population by either being born or by immigrating in, uh, and then organisms leave a population by either dying or by emigrating. Um, so uh, think about immigrating, they're coming into a population, or emigrating, they are exiting a population. Uh, so there are also two main types of growth that can occur. We've got exponential growth, which is indefinite population growth. It just keeps going, going, going. Um, the way that we calculate that is that uh, the growth rate um, is the change in size, which is uh, D uh, capital N over the change in time, which is DT. Um, and that gives us our R, which is the per capita, which means per individual rate of increase. Basically, how many offspring there are per individual. So basically, if we have a positive um, R, then a population is going to be increasing. Um, <clears throat> if we have our R being equal to zero, there's going to be no increase. And if R is negative, then the population is going to be decreasing. Um, and <clears throat> the rate, uh, how large our R value is, is going to determine how quickly our population is going to be growing. Um, and the, the classic kind of shape of an exponential growth curve is the J-shaped curve. Um, that we see here. Now, the other type of growth that we can have is logistic growth, and this is growth of a population. Um, and basically what happens is that as the population is going to be reaching its carrying capacity, population growth is going to be decreasing. Now, carrying capacity is the maximum number of, of um, individuals that a population can hold based on the resources that are in the surrounding areas. Um, and this is a little bit more likely to be what is going to occur in the real world um, because, you know, in the real world, there are limited resources. You don't have unlimited resources. So in general, we kind of see this logistic growth curve. Uh, and the logistic growth curve is, um, is, uh, is due to, uh, sorry, it's shaped like an S-shaped curve um, as opposed to the J-shaped curve of the exponential growth. Um, and the carrying capacity has a greater effect on the rate of growth as n approaches k. So as the uh, size of the population approaches the carrying capacity, population growth tends to slow down more. Um, uh, and so you can kind of see how we use that formula here. Uh, it's k minus n over k. And so you can see that k is having a, a larger impact as n approaches. So um, the reality, um, so those are kind of the main theories. Uh, the reality is that, you know, there's a lot of different things that kind of go into it and that can impact how populations are gonna grow. Um, one of the things uh, that makes kind of this science difficult is that it's difficult to measure populations exactly, right? In the wild, we don't know exactly how many organisms there are. Um, so we use some estimation techniques. One of them we did in class the other day uh, is called mark and recapture. Here's where we're going to capture and mark members of the population. We release them back into the population, and then we recapture members of the population. And using that te those techniques, we're able to come up with an estimate for how large the population is. Um, this is used a lot of times, you know, with dolphins or, or any other types of animals where we, we aren't, don't see them all. We don't have them all kind of locked into a small area. Uh, populations can all be also be distributed in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, we can have clumped populations where they're all kind of sticking into central areas. We can have uniform populations where they're all uh, pretty much the same distance apart from one another. Or we can have random distributions where you might have some that are clumped up and then some others that are kind of spread out. Um, but each of those would give you the same population density as long as there were the same number of individuals, um, but the distribution would be a little bit different. Another way we can look at populations, we can look at population demographics. Um, demographics is the study of populations' vital statistics uh, as they change over time. So this is things like, you know, how many are alive at every year? What's the birth rate? What's the death rate? What's the immigration? What's the immigration? Things like that. Uh, the data is often arranged into data tables. Um, and in your freshman biology class, you might have done an activity um, where you looked at the world population statistics. Um, and those were huge data tables that had statistics on pretty much every single country in the world. 
um, you know, lots of different uh, interesting uh, data that you could find in there. Um, we can also graph that data. Um, so if you take a look here, you can see that the males of these um, of these ground squirrels tend to have a much shorter life expectancy than the females. Um, and you know, you can look and see, okay, what's going on there? Why is that happening? And then and then be able to <clears throat> come up with some, with some explanations. Uh, survivorship curves are um, a good way of kind of look, taking a look at a species or a population, being able to see. Uh, trends in terms of who sur is surviving over time. So, for example, you can see for humans, you know, we have pretty pretty much everybody survives until age 50, but then it begins to die. You know, to people tend to kind of begin to um, to die off around maybe age 60, something like that, uh, and then it kind of decreases down to age 100. Um, for ground squirrels, uh, you can see that the life expectancy <clears throat> is kind of decreasing steadily over time. Um, whereas something like limpets, uh, they have a very low life expectancy early on, and then only a few uh, individuals are surviving for a longer period of time. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting way to be able to take a look at populations, see what's going on, uh, see what kind of trends are happening. Now, when we talk about real population growth, um, not just theoretical population growth, we do see exponential growth sometimes. Um, it tends to occur in small populations that are well below the carrying capacity. Um, so while there still is a large amount of resources available for them, uh, they are able to um, they're able to access that and grow uh, in an exponential way. Um, we see this whenever we grow bacteria in a petri dish, right? That is an exponential growth. There's an un essentially unlimited number of resources um, available for those bacteria. Um, we also see those in the alpha population. Um, they are still well below carrying capacity. Uh, how does undergo logistic growth. Um, if we were to continue to grow the bacteria in the lab, they would eventually plateau at the carrying capacity. You know, the amount of resources available to them from the petri dishes, the amount of space, all that would run out and their population uh, would would uh, curve out, uh, or sorry, would steady out. Um, now, generally, we don't see a beautiful S-shaped curve. In general, what happens is that the uh, population will overshoot the carrying capacity uh, then you will have a large die-off where the population will come back down to the carrying capacity. It might undershoot it a little bit. And the population tends to kind of go up and down around the carrying capacity, sometimes going over, sometimes going under. Um, that's generally what we see more happening more in the real world um, rather than it kind of being this like beautiful, like straight lines, right? You know, real world data is almost never exactly what we think it theoretically could be. Uh, another thing we can kind of take a look at um, is life history traits. And these are kind of, this is kind of a large um, uh, set of theories that are kind of used to describe populations at this point. Um, these are traits that affect an organism's life table. So it's you know, mortality, um, vitality, things like that. Um, there's always a cost and a benefit. Um, so we've got kind of two, uh, we're going to take a look at a few different traits, but one of them is simul parity and itero parity. Um, Simul parity is where you produce a lot of offspring once in your life, and that's it. Uh, examples would be salmon. So the salmon, you know, they live in the Pacific Ocean, then they swim up the rivers, they produce a lot of offspring, and then they die, right? So they only get a chance to produce the offspring once. You know, they get to produce a lot of offspring, but they also don't get to take care of their offspring. Um, and they only get one shot at it, so there's, you know, benefit, there's a cost to that. Um, the benefit is that they, you know, they get to make sure that they have a whole bunch of offspring. Um, we also have itero parity, and that's going to produce a few offspring repeatedly. So that'd be things like humans. You know, most mammal species are all uh, have all display itero parity, um, where you can produce a few offspring, take care of them, raise them up, and then you produce a few more offspring. Um, now, this is obviously going to change the way uh, how how your populations grow, right? Like the salmon population, you know, it starts off. You have a lot of youngsters; they all grow older. Uh, you have a few youngsters when they spawn, reproduce. All of a sudden, you have a lot of youngsters. All the adults die off, and you have, again, a very young population. Um, whereas uh, organisms that display itero parity, they're going to be a little more steady over time. You know, you're going to have a pretty even number of, of adults and, and, uh, and youngsters at, at the same time. Um, parental um, uh, size, um, or sorry, parental care um, uh, is, you know, is going to uh, be affecting how population comes out as well. Um, the number of, of babies that a, that a brood has um, varies inversely with the amount of parental care. 
So the less babies you have, the more parental care you can involve. Um, and if you have more parental care, that means that you're going to generally have a lower life expectancy um, because you're having to put more energy into taking care of your uh, of your kids. Whereas if you um, have a, a lower um, brood, uh, less number of offspring, you're going to have to spend less time taking care of them. Therefore, uh, you can take more time taking you can have more time taking care of yourself. Obviously, this is going to affect you know population, survivorship, things like that. Uh, predator prey relationships. We'll get more, more into that when we talk about community interactions, but um, it does have a large, you know, impact on population sizes um, because they're so closely related to one another. The two populations, um, you know, the predator is completely dependent upon the prey. If the prey populations crash, well, the the, the, pre, the predator population is going to crash because it's not going to have any food to be able to survive. Um, and, and again, we'll take a look at, at, at predator prey reaction uh, relationships in a little more detail later on. Uh, density has a large impact on population growth and population sizes in general. Um, there are a lot of density dependent factors. Uh, we'll take a look at those in, in just a little bit. Um, but essentially what happens is that there is an ideal uh, density uh, at which a species uh, or a population is able to maximize its uh, life expectancy um, as well as you know being able to replace um, as uh, its members as they you know, die of old age or die of, of uh, disease, things like that. Um, and when they get outside of that ideal density, uh, then some other factors help regulate their population size. Um, now, one of the things that we tend to see is that birth rates are generally gonna decrease as population size increases, right? So you have more and more organisms in an area, well, you don't wanna continue to add more and more offspring because then you're gonna have less and less resources available for yourself and also for your offspring. Um, so birth rates generally are gonna be decreasing as population size and therefore population density um, increases. So these are some of the density dependent population um, regulators. Um, competition, right? So there's only a limited amount of resources. So as your density increases, competition is also gonna increase. Um, predation, you're more likely to get eaten if there is a larger number of organisms, right? Because it's going to be easier for the predators to uh, to pick them out. Um, waste is going to accumulate, which is going to help um, do things like spread diseases, um, make it less habitable. Um, uh, you have territoriality. So if you have, as, as density increases, you have more competition over territory, over space. Um, some intrinsic factors. So basically uh, things like, you know, if a, um, if a mouse has a, has a large litter, right, it is not going to be able to take care of all of them. And so some of them might die off. Uh, and then finally, diseases, as you are more closely clumped together, disease uh, is going to be increasing. It's going to be a lot easier to pass diseases on between uh, individuals in a population. All right, let's talk about briefly about human population growth, and then we'll be finished. Um, uh, human population growth is the underlying problem of all anthropogenic, which means that all uh, human caused ecological problems. Uh, you can see the human population growth here. You can see how it really has not started increasing significantly uh, until the last about, uh, I would say about 500 years or so. Um, the rate of increase has been incredible um, and that has generally been associated with the industrial revolution, although truly it began before that um, as well. And you can uh, now we're even up past, you know, 7 billion. Oh, this graph is obviously a few years old. Um, fortunately, the growth rate has been decreasing since it peaked in the 1960s. Um, why? Uh, there's a lot of different factors that, uh, that come in, but the main ones is that uh, industrialization has led to an increase in education, um, which has led to people waiting until later in life to have children, so they're less likely to have as many children. Um, increases in education have kept more women uh, in jobs, so they are less likely to be housewives, right, and, and less likely to just have their roles be, you know, reproducing and, and having children. Um, and also, we have had an increase in the use of contraception, right? Um, so if we are increasing the use of contraception, people can choose when to have kids, uh, and so they're less likely to just, you know, start having kids immediately um, after being married, right? But later on in life, you know, they might choose, okay, now it's time for us to have kids. Um, and this uh, has been is projected to continue to decrease with time. Um, and that leads us kind of into the idea of, you know, what's going to happen to the total human population. Um, now, 
this decrease in the population growth rate overall is not shared in all countries. Um, and the way we know that is we can take a look at these age structure pyramids. And the age structure pyramids are really interesting. They show us the percentage of males and females in each age bracket of a population. So if you were to take a look at Afghanistan, Afghanistan is almost 9% um, uh, males age 0 to 4 and almost 9% females age 0 to 4. So that means that 18% of their population is age 0 to 4, right? Uh, and you can see that as you step up in the age brackets, their population size actually slowly decreases. Um, as their percentage of each age bracket decreases. And what this shows us is this shows us rapid growth, right? We have a large amount of growth that is occurring in this population um, uh, because you have so many children uh, that are that are um, uh, that have such a, a are constituted a larger percentage of the population. Uh, so overall, you have population growth. The United States shows uh, slow growth, uh, a little bit of growth. Um, uh, you have, you know, a, a large amount of, of, of kids, but you don't have nearly as many kids as you do uh, other age brackets. Um, this right here, this is the baby boomer generation right here. Um, obviously, since this uh, picture came out, um, it has actually moved up a little bit. Um, and uh, you can see that this is part of, you know, people complain about Social Security and Medicaid and all that kind of thing. Uh, Italy is showing no growth, um, but you can see that they're uh, children uh, is actually much narrower uh, than their ages, uh, you know, 29 to about 50 or so. Uh, so they're not showing any any population growth at all. Uh, one of the trends we see in industrialized countries is what is known as the demographic transition. Um, this is these are just changes that occur in the demographics of industrialized countries. Um, it generally leads to an increase in vitality. Um, so your uh, industrialized countries have a much lower infant mortality rates, which means that more of your infants survive, so people tend to have less babies. Um, you also have a much longer life expectancy um, in industrialized countries, uh, which obviously puts different strains on, on your system. Uh, the human carrying capacity, last thing we're going to talk about, uh, is dependent upon the amount of resources that each person uses. No one really knows what the human carrying capacity is. Um, it's estimated that it could be as high as maybe 20 billion um, if we all live like Africans do, or not necessarily just African, but anybody that's in a low socioeconomic status, um, you know, very poor, um, not having a lot of amenities like we are used to here in the United States. Um, if we all live like people in the United States, we probably couldn't sustain a very high population, like you know, maybe 5 billion, 6 billion, something like that. Um, most people believe that the, the human population is going to peak out somewhere around 9 billion. Um, that's kind of the rate, the, the trend that's going on right now in terms of the uh, decrease in the pop, in the growth rate um, and just kind of some other factors. So, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.